happy Saturday. Polio has been in the news a lot over the past several weeks after a report in July of an unvaccinated person in Rockland County, New York, contracting polio. After that, polio was detected in wastewater in New York City and also three counties north of New York. Polio had been eradicated in the U.S. in 1979, and there has been similar reporting in other places where it was previously eradicated over this summer as well. So we are bringing out our episode on polio and the development of the vaccines that came close to eradicating it. And a lot of points in this episode land very differently two plus years into the COVID-19 pandemic, like shuttering businesses and quarantining people is something a lot of us have lived through in recent memory, not something we would associate with the Renaissance. Yeah, we, we do not need anybody to call previous hosts Sarah and Dublina sweet summer children. Honestly, most of us were. So uh, this episode was by previous host Sarah and Dublina. It originally came out on November 21st, 2011. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah Dowdy. And I'm Dablina Chakraborty. And Dablina, this year during Halloween, I put on a really fun campy movie. I know you like campy movies, too, I do. Don't you? Yeah. This was a Boris Karloff movie, but it wasn't one of his more famous repertoire, you know, like Frankenstein or The Mummy or something. It was called The Ape. And it was, Ooh. yeah, it was, it was a pretty wild movie. I'm not going to lie. It was about a mad scientist in a small town, but not your typical mad scientist who's, you know, like rolling his fingers and looking evil. He was a kindly sort of fellow. He had a heart. And he was trying to cure something called paralysis in the movie. My Netflix queue told me, though, it was polio. and Gotta love Netflix. <laughs> yeah, gotta love Netflix. Very informative. Um, but the doctor, Boris Karloff, was trying to cure this paralysis, and he was going to do so by obtaining a serum. And of course, because it's a campy horror movie, it goes to the point where he dons an ape suit and goes about murdering people trying to obtain their spinal fluid. But I also noticed, though, that the movie came out in 1940. And as silly as it was, I mean, it, it was enjoyable. I recommend it. But as silly as it was, it was playing off of a very real fear at the time. And that was, of course, the paralysis in the movie, polio, as we know it. Because since polio first First started striking in epidemic proportions in the late 19th century, it had only grown worse and worse and worse. People didn't know how to stop it. They didn't know how it spread. And worst of all, it was something that usually struck kids in the severest form, killing them or paralyzing them for life of an extremely disturbing disease. Yeah. In the United States, for instance, polio epidemics would sweep across the country each summer, striking rural and urban areas, poor and wealthy neighborhoods. Teens and adults could get it too. Um, and it was usually actually worse for them. To stop the spread, modern cities would revert to Renaissance-like plague practices, no travel, no trade, and they would sometimes put quarantines on the homes. The Smithsonian Museum of American History has a New York Times clipping from 1916 about a man who was unable to find a physician for his sick child. And so he drove around and around until the boy died. And even then, he couldn't find anyone to take the body. Yeah, and it wasn't just the fear of catching polio. The after effects of the epidemic were also extremely haunting. Kids in wheelchairs and leg braces, patients in the dreaded iron lung. We're going to talk about that a little more later. And in the early stages of the disease, the patient would often be separated from his or her family for about two weeks, followed by very limited contact, you know, just an hour or so every now and then. And these extended periods of separation made adjusting to life after polio with all its consequences a lot harder. But Today, people, if people have any understanding of polio, it usually relates to FDR, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who contracted the disease as an adult in 1921. Unless you're living in one of the four countries where wild polio virus is still present, the fear just isn't there anymore. You couldn't put out a, a movie anymore about this um, paralysis. It, it needs to be some other sort of scary, contagious virus because there's no longer any reason for somebody to contract polio. 
So we're going to talk about the two very different vaccines that have almost eliminated polio, the men who created them, and the mass inoculations of the 1950s and the 60s that took place. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about what polio actually is. It's paralytic poliomyelitis and is sometimes called infantile paralysis, and it's caused by a virus, the polio virus, which was discovered in 1908 by Carl Landsteiner and Erwin Popper. And today we know that the virus takes a fecal-oral route, meaning that contaminated fecal matter gets into the mouth through the hands or through food or even through droplets from an infected person's cough or sneeze. And once the virus is in the mouth, it starts multiplying in the gastrointestinal tract and lymph nodes. From there, it spreads to the bloodstream. But here's the thing. That's where it stops for most people, which I didn't know before. This was a surprise for me, too. About 95% of people who contract polio don't experience severe symptoms. They might feel like they have the flu or maybe not notice anything at all. These people become resistant to whichever strain of polio they've contracted. Exactly. But if the polio virus keeps going, it attacks the central nervous system, destroying the motor cells of the spinal cord and brainstem. And this usually ends up affecting the limb muscles. So thus, polio is association with paralyzed legs. But it can also hit the facial muscles or the back and abdominal muscles, causing twisted spines. And in the worst cases, it strikes muscles in the respiratory area, which in the early days usually meant a death sentence. The development of the iron lung in the 1920s helped keep these people alive. Interestingly, if you could get through the the acute phase, the first couple weeks um, in an iron lung, your muscles could usually develop enough um, strength or tone to start being able to breathe on your own again. But it took a while to get to that point. Even though the polio virus wasn't discovered until 1908, it's believed to have existed long before that. The mummy of a 19th dynasty pharaoh, for example, who lived between 1342 and 1197 BC, even shows deformities that are characteristic of polio. But still, polio must not have been widespread for many, many centuries. It didn't begin appearing in medical texts until the 1700s. And it wasn't until 1868 that the first epidemic occurred in Oslo. And I think that's so interesting that there's this long dormant period, essentially. Oh, I mean, not dormant. People are still getting polio, or so we believe, but not anywhere like the kind of polio they were getting in the 20th century. The first U.S. epidemic didn't happen until 1894 in Vermont. And by that point, doctors around the world were starting to piece together the fact that you could get polio and not have any symptoms or be resistant and not know that you had ever had polio, um, you know, better understanding the the virus and the disease. But by the 19-teens, epidemics were, polio epidemics were becoming a regular summer occurrence. New York City's first epidemic, for instance, happened in 1916. It affected 9,000 people and killed 2,343. So the race to find a cure for this or create a vaccine to prevent it was definitely on. But before we go on to discuss the attempts to create a vaccine for polio, I think it'll help to know exactly what a vaccine is. I mean, just in case anybody doesn't. And then better understand how people understood vaccines in the 20th century, what they were going into it with. Okay, so first, here's a scenario for you. If you had type 1 polio before and you didn't get sick, it would mean that your body had successfully produced antibodies to fight it off. When you encounter the virus a second time, your body would know what to do with that again. A vaccine, of course, essentially attempts to mimic this response, tricking the immune system into producing antibodies to fight off a virus that's not actually the full strength real deal. It's something similar but not as dangerous, or it's weakened, or it's in a very small quantities. But It's enough to teach your body what to do so that it's ready when the real thing comes along. Exactly. So humans have been likely attempting self-vaccination for thousands of years. But immunization, as we understand it, really kicked off in 1796 with Edward Jenner. And he inoculated a young English boy against smallpox using cowpox, which was not as scary, not as deadly as smallpox, but still um, produced a similar response uh, with 
antibodies. So the next big leap happened in 1885 when Louis Pasteur used a syringe to vaccinate a boy who had been bitten by a mad dog against rabies. The boy would have definitely gotten sick. He would have died from rabies. Um, And the syringe proved to be a way more reliable delivery method than the earlier technique of using things like lances and pus from pox and, you know, kind of kind of gross, but also kind of unreliable methods. Uh, from there, large-scale immunization started by World War I with diphtheria, and it really became something that people were used to, at least with a few specific diseases. But even though medical researchers knew that a vaccine was also feasible for polio, there were some advancements to be made, namely a better understanding of the virus and how to grow it in large enough quantities for a vaccine. In 1931, Australian researchers realized that polio came in different types and that just because you had resistance to one, it didn't mean that you couldn't catch another. So this meant that any vaccine would need to cover all types. That was why that example you, Dublina, you gave earlier specifically was like if you got polio type one. Right. Um, because if you had type two and you encountered type one, then you wouldn't necessarily have a resistance. Another big advancement happened in 1941 when Dr. Albert Sabin and Robert Ward showed that poliovirus wasn't just a disease of the nervous system, even though that was what um, people understood it as, since that's what it attacked. They realized that it entered through the mouth and it first affected the digestive system. So that suggested that a vaccine could possibly stop the virus while it was still in the bloodstream before it even got got to the nervous system and started causing so much damage. Then in 1949, researchers at Johns Hopkins confirmed that the 1931 suggestion that polio came in different types was true. There are three main varieties, one, two, and three. And again, any vaccine had to work on all of them to really work. And in 1949, Dr. John Engers, Thomas Weller, and Frederick Robin showed that the virus could grow on other types of tissue than nervous tissue, like embryonic skin or muscle tissue. So before this, cultivating the virus meant that you had to use live monkeys to grow it, which is something that was expensive and not available to a small lab. Yeah, having huge amounts monkeys growing polio virus. So these three guys ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 1954 for their work. And that finding was really crucial in developing a vaccine because you've got to make large amounts of a vaccine if it's going to do anything. So in the worst decades of polio, paranoia, and fear, there were obviously these big jumps in our understanding of the virus, but there were also some setbacks. In 1935, Dr. Maurice Brody and Dr. John Colmer each conducted separate human trials for their own versions of a polio vaccine. The results were completely disastrous. A lot of kids contracted polio. A few people died. But by World War II, there were again some new advancements in how vaccines were made. The introduction of um, commercially made vaccines for soldiers, manufacturing guidelines, definitely more stringent rules about clinical testing. So it It was setting the stage again for this big revolution we're going to talk about that happened in the 1950s. Fighting polio also became an almost warlike matter for FDR. In 1944, he said, quote, The dread disease that we battle at home, like the enemy we oppose abroad, shows no concern, no pity for the young. It strikes with its most frequent and devastating force against children. And that is why much of the future strength of America depends upon the success that we achieve in combating this disease. But how are they going to combat it? With polio, there were two main ways to go. They could use an inactive or killed virus as the basis for the vaccine, or they could use an attenuated or weakened virus as the basis for the vaccine. So ironically, both of these ended up working well, but there's one that got more of the glory. All right. So enter Dr. Jonas Edward Salk, who was born October 28, 1914 in New York City to Russian Jewish immigrants. He was the first in his family to go to college, and he um, earned his MD from New York University College of Medicine. But while he was studying there, Salk worked under a microbiologist named Thomas Francis Jr., 
who was attempting to create a flu vaccine, which was later used successfully in World War II. So Salk got this early exposure to making vaccines and and trying to think about things like that. And in 1947, the University of Pittsburgh recruited him to work specifically on viruses and ultimately on the polio virus. And by 1952, His research had paid off. He was ready to start testing a killed virus vaccine, so a virus that had been killed with formaldehyde, but um, it left enough of the structure intact to trigger a response like it would to live polio. So first, he tested it on kids who had already had polio and recovered, and they showed boosted antibodies. Then he tested it on institutionalized kids who were disabled or mentally handicapped, as well as on himself, his wife, and his own kids. And, I mean, that's a good point to note that all of this polio research, um, it can come across as kind of unethical today because of tests on institutionalized kids and tests on prisoners, tests on your own family, on, on yourself, and also animal testing, too. I think more than 100,000 monkeys were killed during the whole process of making these viruses or making the vaccinations, rather. So uh, just, you know, something to, to throw out there. And another random note, um, testing it on his wife and kids, it wasn't this wife, but Salk's second wife was Picasso's Um, widow mistress, sort of, Francoise Guillot, who is the mother of Paloma. A little bit of an unexpected connection there. I I just, I thought I had to mention it since I sit next to a photo of Picasso here in the studio, actually. Yeah, I mean, well, there's another connection. (laughs) Dublin is sitting next to Tesla. I know all of you want a podcast on him someday. (laughs) I I was about to say, (laughs) I think people might like mine better, but... So no one got sick from these trials. And since 1952 had also been polio's peak year in the United States with 57,628 cases, it was big news in 1953 when Salk published his findings in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So by 1954, Salk had large amounts of an injectable vaccine and was ready for large trials. The pilot program included 15,000 kids in Pittsburgh, but the main field trial was massive. 1.8 million kids in the U.S., Canada, and Finland in grades 1 through 3 at 215 test sites. The whole thing is directed by Dr. Francis, Salk's mentor, and it featured a double-blind process, which meant that 650,000 people received the vaccine, 750,000 received a placebo, and 430,000 received neither. And it took 300,000 volunteers just to get out there and administer all of these vaccines. And the record-taking, Francis ran a, a tight ship. The record-keeping was really immaculate, all sorts of follow-ups on these people. But by April 1955, it was official. Francis declared Salk's vaccine to be, quote, safe, effective, and potent. And it became available commercially just a few years later. And cases in the U.S. of polio dropped immediately. I mean, 85 to 90 percent. There was one big setback, though, in 1955, a major scare when 200 kids were affected by the vaccine. Uh, It ended up being traced back to one specific manufacturer. There was a not quite dead virus included in the vaccine. But ultimately, once it was determined it was from one specific place, people did go back to Salk's inactivated polio virus vaccine, the IPV. And the last U.S. case of polio occurred in 1979 in an unvaccinated Amish population. And Salk essentially became one of the most famous medical heroes of the 20th century. I read something interesting. His fame almost alienated him from the medical community just because he was so celebrated and because other um, researchers felt like they didn't get any credit for things that they had contributed. So interestingly, Salk continued his research, I think, on HIV kind of stuff, you know, continuing that viral research. But we do have a second vaccine to talk about. We said that there were two. 
And we said that one sort of got all the glory. But what about the vaccine made not from the killed virus, but from the weakened virus? Well, if you grew up in the U.S. and you were vaccinated before 2000, you didn't get Salk's IPV. Instead, you got Albert Sabin's oral poliovirus vaccine, OPV for short. And if you live outside of the U.S. or outside of Europe, you almost certainly got the OPV. So why are there two? And what are the benefits and the dangers of each kind? Well, Sabin was a Polish Jew who had immigrated to America as a child, and he had, as we mentioned, discovered in 1941 that the poliovirus was not just a disease of the nervous system, but one of the intestinal tract. So Sabin had a problem with Salk's idea for a vaccine, um, even though, well, if prepared correctly, Salk's vaccine using the, the killed virus would definitely not give you polio because it had a dead virus in it. It also might not confer a lifetime of immunity. It wouldn't be as strong. So Sabin wanted to create something that was stronger, a stronger vaccine using live polio virus. Although, of course, that means certain risks. So instead of just killing the virus and creating a vaccine from there, he experimented on 9,000 monkeys and 100 chimps. We did mention there were a lot of primates involved here. Before he found a strain of the virus that would reproduce in the intestinal tract, but not in the central nervous system, making that 1941 discovery pretty important. So this meant that he could use a live, weaker strain of the virus and from that, create a longer-lasting vaccine. And there's kind of a strange perk about the um, Sabin vaccine in that when people who get it go to the bathroom, their feces contains a weakened version of the virus, which helps boost the immunity of the population as a whole, which made it pretty desirable in certain areas. We'll talk about that a little bit more, though. Sabin had a problem, though. Once he had finally perfected his OPV um, version of the polio vaccine. Yes, he was ready to go forward with large-scale tests right around the time that Salk's vaccine was being celebrated as a medical miracle. So he couldn't find enough people stateside who were willing to participate. Because why take a risk participating in a trial if there's already a, a good cure out there? Right. So a, a prevention. Exactly. So Sabin went to the Belgian Congo and in the middle of the Cold War to the Soviet Union. And the government gave him a medal for this. I mean, that's how badly they wanted to handle polio, how bad polio was around the world. <laughs> they would let this um, American guy, a, a uh, Polish Jew immigrant, come into the Soviet Union and, and do this wide-scale medical test. But by the early 60s, Sabin's vaccine had caught on in the United States, too. It was cheaper. It was easier to produce. Um, one big perk is that it didn't require a shot because it was an oral vaccine. So that makes it easier to administer, too. And it became completely vital for world eradication efforts, which really took off in the 1970s. And today, polio is endemic only in Nigeria, India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Of the three types of viruses, poliovirus 2 is probably eradicated. The last case to the last known case was in India in 1999. And poliovirus 3 is probably also close to eradication. Yeah. And in 2000, the U.S. switched back to IPV after it was determined that uh, you were – it, it wasn't worth the risk anymore having that live virus in OPV because your risk of contracting polio in North America, wild polio, was just pretty much nothing. Um, you were only likely to, to maybe pick it up if you went to one of those countries where it was still endemic. So the U.S. switched back to IPV. But there's still a big hurdle in eliminating polio in some of those remaining countries, and that's fear and suspicion, just not knowing exactly what um, what people are coming in to do when they're administering these OPVs. Yes, for example, in 2003, the World Health Organization launched a huge campaign to vaccinate 15 million kids in Nigeria. But leaders there spread word that vaccines had been mixed with anti-fertility drugs and the HIV virus. So the World Health Organization has started from the bottom up instead, meeting with local leaders and winning their approval first yeah. before going in and doing this. In order to... to try to knock it out in Nigeria. Uh, one 
sort of final note on the story and the men involved, Salk and Sabin both chose not to patent their vaccines. I mean, they could have probably made huge amounts of money off of this, but they considered the vaccine their gift to humanity. Um, I was really, I, I enjoyed researching this and learning a little bit more about polio. I hadn't known much about Sabin at all, which is surprising now that that I realize what a huge contribution he had to to eradicating polio in most of the world. Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting too. And I think um, even in this day and age, it's important for people to kind of understand what they're dealing with when they're dealing with different vaccines because there's so much misinformation out there and debate about vaccines today. Um, I think it just helps. The more you know, the better. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 